Hey, this is Andy Hill from the Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, and when I'm not singing Disney karaoke songs with my kids at home, I'm stacking Benjamins. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and looks like the guys have finally come to their senses because today we'll talk about how I built this with a guy named Roz. Wait, what? His show and book are called How I Built This. Oh, yeah. No, that's not confusing. Oh, come on. His name is Guy? You sure? Okay. Uh, Turns out we're talking to... the host of a show called How I Built This, Guy Raz. Plus, do you have a dream of retiring and living out the rest of your day sipping margaritas on a tropical beach? Well, what if I also told you that you could live in some of these tropical paradises for less than $2,000 a month? Tune into our headline segment to learn where. And finally, we'll toss out the Haven Lifeline to a guy named Francisco... Oh, that's definitely the coolest name we've had call in. Francisco wants to know about expense ratios. Oh, that's not as cool as his name. Well, anyway, OG's very excited. And then there will be some of my stellar How I Built This themed trivia. And now, two guys who built a podcast in a basement with my help, which is so different than all the other nerds out there podcasting. It's Joe and oh, J-J-J-J-G. Innovation is what it's called, Doug. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I am Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. Happy Wednesday to you. Man, do we got a great show. First of all, we have sitting across the card table from me, as usual, on a Wednesday, Mr. OG. It's a rainy Wednesday here, my is, side of the basement. It is a rainy, rainy it's, Wednesday. It's very moist. I, I just, I, I don't. It's very moist outside. Unless you're talking about cake, I don't like the word. I can't figure out what I don't I like about that word. The grass is very moisty. Not my, not my favorite word. You know what I do like, though? I do like it when the kids go to school on scholarships. Yeah, tell me about it. Head to stack your bed. the only way my kids are going to school. <laughs> We teamed up with our friend Pam Andrews, who is the scholarship shark. What should we do for the tagline? Send your kids to college on scholarships without going to jail. Would that be a good tagline? Too soon, maybe? Ah, uh, yeah, maybe just a bit. To get, get your kid into college without the lying lawsuit. about it. Yeah. <laughs> St- Stackybenjamins.com forward slash scholarships uh, for more on how our team can help your kids go to college. We got a great show today. We got a gentleman that you may have heard of named Guy Raz joining us. He has a new book out, weirdly entitled How I Built This, one of my favorite podcasts, and we'll see if he's also going to be one of my favorite people. I don't know. We're going to talk to him later today. But first, OG and I got a couple great headlines, so let's get moving. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from CNBC. This is written by Jade Scipioni. Four tropical places you could live well for less than $2,000 a month. How great would it be to retire in the tropics on $2,000 a month? I'm in. Just tell me how, baby. Do you think you can podcast from there? uh, We've already proved. We can podcast from anywhere. Heck, if I can podcast from Vermont, I can podcast from... Well, let's talk about this. A new report from International Living, a website about living and retiring overseas, the piece reads, figured out some of the best places to live in the world for under $2,000 a month, and four of them are tropical destinations. Most Americans don't realize just how expensive the United States is in many regards, Jennifer Stevens, Executive Director of International Living, said in a statement. According to 2018 data from the U.S. Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Expenditure Survey, the average American household spends $5,000, 102 every month. 
That means the average American budget, 61224 a 1.9% increase from 2017. But Stevens also said most Americans are pleasantly surprised to discover what $30,000 a year or less can get you internationally. And so number one on their list is retiring to Mexico. You know, we had uh, Tamara Jacoby on from the Tailwind Lodge in Mexico. And when her family built that lodge, she talks about how completely inexpensively they live in this beautiful area cut out of the jungle in an amazing community. Absolutely loves being being in Mexico. And a lot of people, I think, just picture, you said the jungle, and I, a lot of people just picture Mexico as being beaches or very tropical, but there's a lot of topography in Mexico too. And, you know, for example, Mexico City, what are they at 8,000 feet or something? It's a very temperate area. Yes. Our friend Kevin, in fact, who uh, we yeah. work with on a lot of projects, has moved to Mexico with his family. I have uh, other personal friends who for work, my friend Craig works for Siemens, lives also in, in Mexico and uh, has a beautiful house in a nice neighborhood and lives on half, he says, of what he was living on when he lived in Michigan. Number two is Costa Rica. Have you been to Costa Rica? Have not, but know people who have. Yeah, I've had lots of friends that have gone there. International Living Costa Rica correspondent Kathleen Evans describes this small but eco-friendly country as one of the happiest places in the world for expats seeking a healthier life overseas. Close in proximity to the U.S. with less than a three-hour flight to Orlando, Florida. You know, this is the thing. You move away from family, OG, family and friends. People forget how important that is, by the way. They think, oh, you know what? I'll retire. I'll retire on less. And then you move away from family and friends. And I'll tell you, when we left Texas, how difficult that was for us, even though, you know, you can talk to them on Zoom calls, you can just call them up, text, whatever. Not the same as being able to just go down the street to your friend Mike's house, as an example. Right. In our case, when we moved across the country, we ended up having uh, more people visit our house. <laughs> by, <laughs> by being, But we were in a nicer area. The difference with international travel, of course, is it's a little... People are a little more intimidated by that, I think. They they are, but I think you'd still have a lot of people, tri- oh, let's go to Costa oh, Rica. And- look, you have an extra bedroom and it's snowing in Michigan and you live in Costa Rica. Man, a, a place I've heard a lot lately about from uh, friends, uh, notably uh, Jen Hempel, who's uh, from here. She has a great podcast called Her De Niro Matters. But a few other friends lately talking about Colombia and about how uh, there's a ton of expats living in Colombia now. Yeah. And uh, just how beautiful that country is. Uh, the piece says International Living Columbia correspondent Nancy Kiernan says the country seed a steady growth of expats since being a top retirement destination in 2017. According to the World Health Organization, Columbia ranks number 22 for its healthcare system, while the U.S. clocks in at number 37. What's more, the cost of living is very low. A couple can live comfortably in Medellin, the second largest city in Colombia, for 1394 to 1994 a month or 16700 to $24,000 a year. By the way, interesting thing about Colombia, by the way, I looked into as we were talking about traveling all over on this current journey that now has us in East Lansing, Michigan. By the way, go green. We thought about going to Colombia. And when we were looking at that before COVID hit, I could have rented a place in Colombia for a month that was in a beautiful part of, of Bogota for uh, $2,000 a month. Just, just an absolutely fantastic apartment. I could get a nice, well-appointed apartment for $1,000 a month, but you, I could have lived like a flipping king on 2000 a month there. Of course, you don't want your rent to be 90% of, 90% of your, your cost. So we would have gone for the $1,000 a month spot. But it, but it was amazing what we could have got. Number four here is uh, Panama. International Living Editor Jessica Ramesh. Panama. Dun, dun, you know dun. all about it, don't you? David Lee Roth uh, describes Panama as one of the few places that welcome new residents with attractive and inexpensive residence programs. For $800 a month, you can rent a two-bedroom house in a small mountain town in Panama, about 37 miles from the Costa Rica border. Uh, the cost uh, can be as low as $2,000 a month or $24,000 a year. I'm in. Let's do it. An option. Do we need anybody's permission or do you got to talk to Cheryl? No, but I will tell you, these places sound great. 
and to people just dreaming about maybe a great retirement, you and I talked on Monday about people going, hey, I'm going to go ahead and die early so that I can pretend <laughs> that my retirement's okay. Instead of doing that, maybe moving to these places is great. But I have to tell you, OG, I thought that be, being a nomad was going to be fantastic for me. And as you and I have talked about on many occasions, being a nomad for me, not at all what I thought it was. And maybe it's a good idea to take a long vacation to one of these places, like a month, if you can get away from work for a month to see how you will actually do. Because I have to tell you mentally, it's not the same, not the same thing. Well, even you don't even have to take the vacation. Everybody's working from home now, right? That's true. So Good just point. Grab your laptop and your in your hot spot and go and see if you like it. Yeah. There's parts of it that I really like and there's parts that I don't. I like the ability to to pick up and go whenever I want. I really don't like the feeling of homelessness. Yeah. Yeah. About not having any roots. It just I thought I'd love that. I do love the ability to just say, hey, screw it. I'm I'm going to X place today and I don't have anything tying me down. Love that. Which means I think there's a happy medium of having a house with less shit in it, you know, mm -hmm. have a place that has has less stuff and maybe make fewer commitments on my time. Our second headline comes to us from Inc. Have you seen Google's new certificate program OG for college? Uh, I've seen advertisements for it. Google's plan to disrupt the college degree is absolutely genius. Of course, this is an opinion piece written by Justin Barriso. Justin writes, Google made waves recently by announcing its new program, Google Career Certificates, a collection of courses designed to help participants get qualifications in high-paying, high-growth job fields without attending a university. The courses should take about six months to complete and will cost a fraction of a traditional college education. A week before this piece, the author Justin wrote about Google's plan to disrupt the college degree and is talking about the response, which was huge. But there, of course, have been some skeptics. He says, Kent Walker, Senior Vice President of Global Affairs at Glogal, succinctly put it in a blog post, quote, we will consider our new career certificates as the equivalent of a four-year degree for related roles. Now, th this brings up something, OG. So I like the idea of only going to school for six months and getting everything that you need. I like the fact that there's somebody who's hiring who says that they look at it similarly to a four-year degree. But this is Google saying that they're accepting their own certificate is a four-year degree. I got to imagine there's a bunch of hiring managers out there who aren't as, I don't know, forward thinking if if you think that this is a great thing or that... Um, think that six months can equal four years. Do you think this is going to be as disruptive as, uh, as Google hopes it'll be? Well, if people get out of their own way, yeah. Because again, it's not about the necessarily the piece of paper. It's whether or not you can do the work. And I think we've swung the pendulum so far to the, well, if you don't have the piece of paper, it must mean you can't do the work. But now, you know, what Google and other places are trying to do, and I've known people who are who have changed careers into tech fields, and they're doing this exact same thing. They're getting requalified or getting qualified, I guess, not even requalified, getting qualified by doing an accelerated program like this and saying, if I can get through this, that means that I'm qualified to do this work because they compress all of that. You know, it's like, why, why do you have to go to school for four years if you can get it done in nine months? You know. And come out with the same understanding. This also doesn't preclude you, I suppose, if you get this certificate and then decide that you want more from going back and getting four years later. And in fact, studies have shown that older adults are much more likely to do more with a four-year education than people right out of high school. Because people who are older and have some work experience actually know why the hell they're in school. Yeah. Well, and then they don't fiddle around with it either. Yeah. They recognize the value of time. Same. I don't need to do this for four years just because the world says it's going to take four years. I should try to do it in three or I'm not going to take the fluff golf class. You know, I'm going to take stuff that I need to learn so that I can be better. You know, though, when it comes to a degree, I mean, let's take uh, some of the Ivy League schools, for example. Some of the some of the cost of that, I think, isn't actually about the school. It's about who you're networking with. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, I'll give you some examples. Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg worked for the Winklevoss twins. 
knew the Winklevoss twins before, according to them, he ripped them off, right? But but that was the original. I think according to everyone. <laughs> yeah. yeah, maybe according to most people uh, that he did that. You also had uh, Steve Ballmer was roommates with Bill Gates. Tommy Lee Jones and Al Gore were roommates. Like you have these people who are moving in society at a very young age or are thinking about moving in society and you're around these people. I mean, there's got to be something to proximity uh, when it comes to some of these degrees, especially some of the most prestigious schools. Well, yeah, obviously. And in some cases coming from a top program for whatever your field is will really matter also. But if you're, if you're getting the generic, I guess they don't have these in these Google classes, but if you're getting the generic accounting degree at insert state school here, and you compare that against the other generic accounting degree at insert state school here. Yeah. There's no, not a marked difference. It's interesting you say that because as you're talking, I'm thinking about uh, Scott Galloway, who has talked about this, about how the top schools like Harvard are not going to be affected by changes like this. There's still going to yeah. be a bunch of people that go there. But you are going to have some people, OG, that won't want to go to Harvard. They'll want to do this instead to get on with it. You know, why take out a bunch of student loans if I can just get it done in six months and get where I'm going quicker? Makes a lot of sense to a lot of people. Those people, as an example, decided to go to Michigan State because they weren't going to get into Harvard. They were on Harvard's wait list. Now, instead, they're not going no, to Michigan. Weren't. What's that? No, they weren't. Yeah, they absolutely were. They were this close to going. In their to- mind, they were on the <laughs> wait list. <laughs> they, they would have been on the wait list had they filled out an application. Easy. So they decided to go to Michigan State, second best school in the nation behind mm-hmm. Harvard but they were on the Harvard wait list. Now they get in because somebody who is going to Harvard decided not to go because of this program. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And now they get in and now Michigan state's pulling people away from Western Michigan, let's say that we're going to go to Western. Now they're accepted to state. And then, so it, I think you are going to have some of these programs at the, I don't want to say at the bottom, but you know what I mean? You're going to have some of these small programs. And I think maybe most affected, do you think it'll be like some of the expensive liberal arts schools? Yeah. Now, this stuff from Google in particular looks to me like it's really perfect for early slash mid-career people who just want to completely change course. You know what I mean? Yes. Like, like as opposed to going, okay, I don't know the first darn thing about coding or whatever. And, oh, well, Google say, no, 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 you don't have to say, oh, well, you can do this and you can do it at your pace. And when you come out of it, we're going to give you the blessing that says that you can work for us, which means that you can therefore work for just about any tech company out there. But rather than kind of throwing your hands up in despair, here's a, here's a path that you can take. You know, if you don't want to be a accountant anymore, you can go do this. Yeah. Four years is a, four years is a long moat to swim. That's a long way, especially if you're feeding a family, you feel trapped. You're right. Six months is something that you may be able to endure. So I wonder if um, that's maybe the audience, not the like high school to college people, yeah. or yeah. If, the, if the audience is like early career, like I got my accounting degree and now I'm 28 and I go, yeah, I hate accounting. <laughs> yeah. I want to go back. I want to go I want to play on computers all day. Well, and I'm even thinking about the networking stuff I said earlier, because, you know, I think about proximity, maybe because of my age, OG, I would think that uh, there's a lot of people out there who are younger that it isn't about proximity anymore. I mean, you can, because of social media, you can get proximity to a lot of people that you couldn't get proximity to before without having to be in Boston in the same class they're in. Yeah. You just got to know it helps to be in the same class. It does help to be in the same class. I I totally agree. Can you imagine, would you say Tommy Lee Jones and Al Gore? Yeah. Roommates. How about that? Yeah. I think that's takeaway. I think there's so many, so many takeaways there. It doesn't take four years. Uh, It does take kind of knowing where you're going. And I have to say for me, the four years that actually was seven of some pretty crappy jobs as I tried to complete my degree, I learned so much from those early jobs that as I went through college, I can't imagine how I would have done it. I was just so immature how I would have done it in six months and had any clue where I was going. But um, yeah, lessons about networking, paying bills for college that you don't know why the hell you're paying them, the value of early work, so much there. And then when it comes to living overseas, I think you can widen your net, but I also think that you should probably play test it before you just head for Columbia for the next 30 years. (laughs) 
So the next guy who I'm about to talk to on my dad's shortwave radio, you may have heard of before. He does a show about people building businesses and how they did that. He has another show introducing popular Ted items. He's been with national public radio for most of his career. The person I'm talking about obviously is none other than guy Roz. I'm not sure what else you say about guy Roz. Go listen to his shows. You're going to recognize the voice if you're not sure who I'm talking about the second that I pick up the phone over here. Uh, let's say hi to Guy Raz. And I'm my dad's shortwave. It's Guy Raz. How are you, Guy? I'm great, Joe. Thanks for having me on. I have to ask about your background before we talk about the book, because I would think that a guy who's created and hosts a podcast like How I Built This, you've got to be, you must be a natural entrepreneur. True? It's funny because the answer is yes, but I would never have thought about myself that way until I began to really reflect on my life. When I was a kid, like many kids, I loved making money. I loved um, running lemonade stands and I loved curating garage sales and, and, and taking a cut from my dad, you know, for the stuff that the old records and things that he would let me sell. And from an early age, I loved being independent. You know, I loved being able to work and make money. And so from the age of 13, back then it was a little bit easier than it is now to get a work permit. I was working in the mall in the San Fernando Valley at a toy store and was paid three twenty five dollars an hour. And that enabled me to have spending money in cash. And so when I kind of reflect on it, I have the instincts and the desire I always had. But the first part of my life, I spent not being an entrepreneur, really. I mean, formally. I was a, a reporter, a journalist. I worked for a news organization, NPR. You know, and it took me some time before I left and started my own production company, my own business, but that was really what I did. What I discovered on reflection, and what I think a lot of people who do work for big companies discover on reflection, is that you don't have to work outside or independently to be entrepreneurial. You can actually, and oftentimes you are, practicing entrepreneurial skills within your organization. So, for example, me as a reporter, reporters are entrepreneurial. You get sent somewhere, you got to find a translator if it's a foreign country, a driver. Um, you got to find people who are willing to talk to you. You got to get you got to get to a facility to send your story quickly. Um, you hear a lot of no's. Um, you hear a lot of rejection. There's a lot of walls and obstacles you confront. Um, and I think it's the same thing in almost any profession. So I didn't think about myself that way until I had the opportunity to really begin to reflect on my life, my instincts, and the things I love doing to come to the realization that I am entrepreneurial. It's funny because as you're talking, I'm thinking about uh, the fact that a lot of people call business, well, you know, the art of war, right? A book that business owners and business people point to all the time. And yet you were a war correspondent. Is that really an apt analogy? Business is war. I'm uncomfortable with it. I understand it. And I understand the sentiment behind it. I guess I would reframe it by saying there are things that war preparation can teach you about running a business. You know, war is about vanquishing your enemies and total defeat. And that can be motivated by a number of things, right? If it's World War II, the motivation is to vanquish the Axis powers because they were truly evil, um, which is a, a morally necessary goal. To me, a better way to look at it is that running a business is warlike in the sense that you have to be resourceful and efficient and you have to inspire camaraderie and unity and a common sense of purpose. There has to be a mission behind what you're doing and the strongest businesses, the strongest products, the strongest ideas, they bake mission into their brand and their product or service from day one. Even before you or, or, or I know what that product is, they've baked mission into it because that's how you marshal the troops. That's how you get the people who believe in you to fight for you and to, and to help you grow something into, into something that is transformative to millions of people. Well, it is funny. I mean, as you're talking about that, uh, an episode that you had on just recently about uh, 
about the rad power bikes guy. It's almost not just marshalling your own troops, but creating these huge fans, right? On the other side, turning your customers into people that are doing marketing for you. It's actually the holy grail of marketing. And it's not unattainable, but it's very, it requires you to come up with a product, service, or an idea that is extraordinary. So think about a product like Rad, Rad Power Bikes, okay? This is a, an electric bike, bicycle. Most of them are bright orange. They're beautifully designed. They're the kind of product that when you see somebody riding it, you are likely to ask them a question, especially if you are a cyclist. And I know that because I own one. I bought a Rad Power Bike two years ago, long before they – I was interested in having them on the show. And I, I, when I buy things, I don't buy them under my name, primarily because I don't want people to, if they recognize my name, I don't want them to get all excited and start pitching the show. I, I want, and I want to buy something honestly and try it out. And I bought this bike because I've got two kids and I wanted to cycle around, you know, the Bay Area where I live and, and have them on the back. And, you know, having two 50 pound kids on the back of your bike, you need some electric help there. <laughs> the bike I bought was was beautiful. If the price was right. It's bright orange. Everywhere I went, Joe, people stopped to ask me about that bike. That was two and a half years ago. I live in, in Berkeley, California. Everywhere I'd go, a farmer's market, a park, when I'd ride the bikes, uh, the kids to school or pick them up from school at a stoplight, another bike would pull up and ask me questions. Today, I see that bike all over Berkeley and Oakland and San Francisco, everywhere. That is a company that has benefited from that kind of word of mouth marketing, the trusted source, which is a person who you know or respect or just see and talk to is telling you about it. It's the same idea with other products that are extraordinary. You know, you think of Tesla's, for example. It's an extraordinary product. It's very different from any other car out there. How do I know this? Because if you know somebody who has one, that's all they talk about. <laughs> and that is a company that actually doesn't spend a whole lot on marketing or advertising because they don't have to. I just had a conversation with the, the founders of a brand called Life is Good. You probably are familiar with it. You've seen the t-shirts, the guy with the sure. sunglasses and the beret, and it says Life is Good. Um, they're on mugs and artwork that you would put up in a beach house. A little kitschy, but these guys, Burton and John Jacobs, the reason why their brand and product has grown and continues to grow is because their fans connect with the message of optimism and resilience that they're putting out into the world. They are essentially brand ambassadors. You know, you're wearing a shirt that says, um, you know, w w whatever it might be. You know, right now they've got shirts that are connected to the COVID crisis. So. One of their shirts says, says um, more science, less fiction. And then underneath <laughs> it says life is good, right? And essentially, their fans are brand ambassadors. They're walking around with these shirts with these very positive messages at a time when there's so much despair in our country, in the world. People are, are grasping for moments of levity and joy. And that's been hugely powerful for them. So you're exactly right. I mean, it's exactly right when it comes to these products that – that are extraordinary in a sense, that are, you know, very different. It's it's and just to kind of add on to this very briefly, and I'm sorry I'm so long winded, but I get so excited about this stuff. There's a, a famous marketing expert, you know him, Seth Godin. Your listeners will know about him. And Seth has a theory, it's called the purple cow theory. And basically what Seth says is if you're driving down a country road and you see a brown cow eating grass in a field, you're going to keep driving. But if you're driving down a country road and you see a purple cow eating grass in a field, you are going to stop your car, take a picture, put it on Instagram and Twitter and tell all your friends about it because it's a purple cow. His point is, is that if you want a product or service to resonate and to grow through word of mouth, it has to be a purple cow. I think about uh, Herb Kelleher and Southwest Airlines when you talk about that. 100%. I mean, think about how much of a purple cow that airline was. They launched in the 70s. This was at a time when air travel was very expensive. It was primarily limited to wealthy people and business travelers. It was a very formal process. There was a ritual to it. All of a sudden, Southwest comes in. They're only flying 737s. Uh, well, that came later, obviously, but Basically, their model is flying 737s. There's no seat assignments. It's very inexpensive. You get a free drink. They're very friendly, but there's no frills. And it's going to be an inexpensive way to travel, but no frills. And that was radical at the time. Other airlines were laughing at them. 
you know, who's going to go on this thing? Who's going to go on this flying bus? Well, who's laughing now? Southwest Airlines is, the, I think, the fourth biggest airline in the world. Pan Am, TWA, Continental, Braniff, you know, <laughs> they populate the graveyard of airlines, right? Those were brands that tried to quash Southwest in the beginning. But Southwest kept its eye on the, you know, on the long-term goal, and it was a purple cow. It's funny, as you're talking, I'm thinking about how these are just wonderful case studies. And obviously, how I built this is just it's case study after case study, learning through stories. How did you first develop how I built this and think in terms of case studies? Was that natural to you as a reporter? Or was it something you learned at your time at Harvard? Tell me about that. Sure. It's really what inspired the show and now the book, which is an experience I had um, To be clear, I'm not a graduate of Harvard, but a year-long fellowship there as a journalist. It's called the Neiman Fellowship. And I took a class at Harvard Business School that year, just at a whim, really. I was really stunned to learn how they teach business school. This was back in 2008. And I didn't know that business school was taught through stories called the case study method, where you basically are handed the story of a company, how it was created, and usually it ends on a cliffhanger with some turning point, some crisis, and you don't find out how it was resolved until the next week when you go back to the class. And I was just blown away. I think the first one we got was about Howard Schultz and Starbucks. I was blown away because these stories were so good. They were so interesting. They were so inspiring. And it was completely opposite of what I thought a business school class would be. And that idea was planted in my head that that we could actually, that I could actually do something like this in audio. You know, I've been in audio for 25 years. I started out as a radio reporter in the late 90s. And I knew that we had the ability to tell these stories in a deep and meaningful and powerful way and to do it for free, to give our audience these these lessons for free. You didn't need to go to business school. You didn't have to have an MBA. We could bring those case studies to you. And that's really the origin of the story and then of the book, which is ultimately the way you teach business and the way you teach creativity And the way you teach people to have the courage to pursue a disruptive idea, whether it's out in the world on their own or within their own company, is by showing them examples of other people who did it. And that's why I wrote the book. That's why I started the show, because I wanted to show people examples of how other people did it, contextualize it, and make it clear that this is a path that is well-worn, well-trodden. And you want to go on that path? Guess what? You can learn a lot from how this person pursued the same or similar idea, and it's all out there for you to learn from. I remember the first time that I did a case study, I was working with American Express, and we studied Benihana and how it was created. And it's funny walking into a Benihana guy and seeing why the bar area is so much bigger and older Benihana than they were in the early days because they learned that they made so much money on drinks yeah. while you're waiting for your table and just hearing about Rocky and creating that business. And then I, I obviously, then I heard how I built this and I feel like I get that same thing every week. I want to dive into a few of the themes from early in the book though. One is around this idea of passion. You know, you've been doing this for a long time. I hear the word passion now and and you kind of roll your eyes With all of your interviews, is it passion that's important? Is it that you come across uh, an idea? Is it passion? Is it obsession? What is it? Yeah, passion is a really misunderstood word because you often hear people say, follow your passion or pursue your passion. And sometimes that's good advice. You know, I'm very lucky. My passion is talking to people and learning from them. And that's, I've made a living off of it, right? That's how I earn my income. So I'm very lucky. The reality is that not everybody can pursue their passion. You know, some people, they are working to earn a living, and that is that is honorable work. There's probably a better way to think about a business, and it's not about pursuing a passion, but it's about solving a problem. Here's an example. Wayfair is one of the biggest, and actually has grown incredibly fast this year during COVID. Wayfair is one of the biggest furniture and homewares, you know, online shops in the world bigger than Amazon when it comes to furniture and homewares. The guys who started Wayfair, Steve Conine and Naraj Shah, were not passionate about furniture. These guys met at a math camp when they were in high school. And they were they were super math nerds. And then they went to Cornell and became roommates and really good friends. And they started a couple of businesses together that, you know, some did okay. But 
eventually they landed on e-commerce and on on furniture. And the reason why they landed on furniture was, again, not because they were passionate about it or they knew a whole lot about furniture. What they were passionate about was solving a problem. And the problem they wanted to solve was, why is it that only people who live in Boston, where they lived, or San Francisco, or Chicago, or New York, or Los Angeles, or Miami, have access to high-end, excellent designer furniture, you know, beautifully designed furniture. Whereas if you live in Marfa, Texas, or Texarkana, or Amarillo, or Omaha, you don't have that easy access. You can't. Now, this is back in the early 2000s when e-commerce was still relatively nascent. So if you lived in those parts of the country, you couldn't just go to a local store and find really high-quality, affordable furniture. It wasn't available to you. And the problem they wanted to solve was how do we change that? How do we make it? So if you live in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, or in you know Binghamton, New York, you can get the same quality furniture, affordable furniture, as anybody in any of these big cities. That was Wayfair. That was what drove and drives their passion today. So passion is something that you can develop. You know, especially if you're looking to solve a problem. It's not the product or the service necessarily that drives your passion. It's the problem it's solving that drives the passion. Marfa, Texas pull for the win, by the way. Where did that come from? You know, Marfa, Texas is a bad example because it's actually a pretty hipster town. It is a hipster town. Yeah. It it's is. a super hipster town. And I think people in Marfa, <laughs> Texas have figured out how to get all the things they want. But I, it just came to me. Yeah. I'm like, wow, that's a good one. I've been to Marfa and I'm like, that's in the middle of nowhere. That's good stuff, guy. <laughs> I want to ask about something else in early chapters, which I know, you know, we hear about all the time on the show, which is. People are afraid. I mean, I'm afraid to do the wrong thing with my money. I'm afraid to go ask my boss for a raise. I'm afraid that this idea that I have might not pay off. Talk to me for a second about the people you've interviewed around fighting fear. Fighting fear is the single biggest obstacle to pursuing your idea or creating or, or introducing something disruptive in the world, whether it's in your business, existing office space or business place or or doing it on your own. And this is a well-worn path. Lots of people have written about this. You can read about it in many common business books, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. I know it's a controversial book, but I just to just throw that one out there. But even, even in like Dale Carnegie, you know, or Stephen Covey, I mean, some of these great writers and thinkers have have pointed to fear as this huge obstacle. And the reality is that we have that instinct as a survival mechanism. Like our species naturally has fears because that's why we are here on planet Earth today. If we didn't have fears, if we were somehow that gene didn't exist, we wouldn't be alive because we would have been eaten by all those animals out there on the savannas, <laughs> right? We need to have fear. The problem is, is that today we're not threatened by the saber-toothed tigers and the woolly mammoths, but we still have that instinct within us. It's why people are afraid of public speaking, for example. Now, how do you get over that fear? How do you conquer it? It's very, very challenging. It is not easy. It's very doable, but it requires work. It's not something that you can just wake up and stop feeling. Some people have a slightly more natural ability to conquer their fears. You know, Mark Cuban is a good example from, you know, when he was a teenager, he was reading a book called How to Retire at 35. He knew he wanted to be a millionaire and he pursued that with incredible vigor. But he's he's an exception to the people I've interviewed. You know, most of them had fears. I mean, Sarah Blakely, who founded Spanx, she had fears. How does she, this one person, unknown, create undergarments, hosiery, you know, hosiery that will transform women's fashion? Well, she learned how to conquer her fear by being a sales rep for eight years, by selling fax machines door to door, going door to door, selling fax machines, is really scary because a lot of people are going to say, not interested, leave my property, whatever it might be. By the way, when I was a reporter, it's not easy to go up to random people on the street and ask them for their opinion about something. You know, it's called Vox. We would take Vox. We would go around and just ask people questions. And most of the time people say, not interested, please leave me alone. It requires some courage to do that. But it gets easier and easier the more you do it. It's like any kind of exposure therapy. If you're exposed to rejection, it becomes easier to deal with 
the fear of rejection and the fear of people saying no because you know that eventually people will say yes. I'll give you a simple example. I love interviewing Mormons, okay? <laughs> it's going to sound a little weird. <laughs> and I hope this doesn't come across as flip because I have so much respect for people of faith and certainly for people who are members of the Church of, of Jesus Christ, Latter-day Saints. I grew up playing with Mormon kids in Southern California, so just wonderful memories. Here's why I'm really interested in talking to Mormon entrepreneurs. We've had several on the show, David Neeleman of JetBlue and David Smith of Cotopaxi and Joel Clark of Kodiak Cakes. Many young Mormons, and I apologize, I'm, I'm using Mormon as a shortcut. Really, it's, it's not the official name of the church, but I'll just use it for a shortcut. Many young Mormons go on a mission for two years. They go to Brazil or Australia or wherever they go, Africa. They're sent there with no money, a little bit of money, and they got to be self-sufficient. They're 19 years old. They go somewhere for two years. They can't have much contact with their families, and they get to talk to their families two or three times or four times a year, and they have to knock on thousands of doors a week or a month because basically they're, they're kind of selling a product. The product is, is the faith, right? They are trying to bring new people into the faith, and you are selling an idea. And 900 of those doors are slamming in your face. And, and some of the times people are not kind. They're unkind. They're not friendly. And yet these missionaries have to just keep marching forward to the next house and the next house. And they have to be polite and gracious and kind and, and keep moving forward. Well, after two years, they get back to, to the U.S. They're 21. They're in a much better position to take on the world than a 21-year-old who hasn't had that kind of experience. Because they've now been exposed to so much rejection and so many challenges that you can throw anything at them and they're ready to go. And I think it's a really interesting case study, an example of how to develop, how to kind of steal yourself and build resilience that helps you to begin to overcome the kinds of fears that prevent people from starting businesses or introducing disruptive ideas into the world. It seems to me too, Guy, getting back to an earlier theme that – a way to push past fear while I'm listening to your examples is to focus on the problem, right? If you're focusing on solving the problem, you're not focused on the fear. You're focused on the fact that this is something the world needs to see. 100%. I'll give you an example of my life. I am naturally introverted. I'm so moved and passionate about my audience. We have a, a very large, passionate and devoted audience, and, and they communicate with me on social media and, and all these places. And it becomes overwhelming at times because I can't always... I actually never can answer all of them, and it's in my instinct to want to answer everybody because I, you know, I I, I want to. But um, naturally, I'm introverted, and in normal times when we have live events and I do shows in these big auditoriums, I'll usually kind of make a surprise visit to the lobby afterwards. But I'll wait for like 20 minutes, and it's usually there are a couple stragglers, and it's super fun. But I get exhausted after a while because I put so much of my energy into being there for my listeners and my audience. I'm also not the kind of person who easily meets people. It's just not my nature. It's not easy for me to walk up to people and say, hey, I'm Guy Raz. How are you? Let's, you know, tell me all about yourself. Even though I do that on my shows, in my private life, it's harder for me to do that. What helped me overcome the fear of talking to strangers and kind of striking up conversations was becoming a reporter. Once you gave me a notepad, and I remember this so clearly when I was 20, 21 years old. I had my first assignment to write an article for a newspaper called the Washington City Paper in D.C. Once you gave me a notepad, I could go up to anybody and ask them any question. And I didn't care if they said no because it wasn't about me. It was about the mission of getting that story in print. I had an assignment. I had to fulfill it. And that was an, an incredibly powerful experience for me. And I think it's what attracted me to becoming a journalist early in my career because it was like I had this invisible shield that protected me from the fear of talking to people. And that shield was a notepad, eventually it became a microphone. And so there's no question that when the mission, when there's a higher purpose, and it's not about you, but it's about fulfilling a mission or a purpose, it's much easier to conquer the fear. The book is called, and by the way, not very imaginative with your title here, Guy. It's called How I Built This. <laughs> Seems like you might have uh, might have changed that up a little bit, but no, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's called How I Built This, and it's available everywhere, correct? Yep, available everywhere. It's awesome. Well, thanks for hanging out with us for a few minutes, Guy, and talking about fighting fear and 
and achieving some greatness. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Joe. Hey, stackers. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And thanks again to Guy Raz for stopping by the basement. I sure love to hear him talk about all these motivating and inspirational people who have built the brands we're surrounded by today. And I'm also having a hard time figuring out how he's leaving a certain entrepreneur off the list. This person didn't start his business out of a garage like those run-of-the-mill tech founders. Instead, this super intelligent, funny, witty, incredibly handsome guy built his business in a basement. I'm sure we all know who I'm talking about, right? I mean, let's be honest. I'm sure you're as confused as I am why guy hasn't asked me to be on his show yet. I can keep going on all day, but to prove it, let's get you some of today's very brilliant trivia. Question is this, Danny Meyer is the founder of this alternative restaurant chain. He somehow managed to guest host on How I Built This about his business before I was on. That's a mystery we won't solve. And this chain is sweeping the U.S. with their burgers and recently announced plans to open their first drive through What is Danny's burger-centric restaurant? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can build an award-winning podcast all on your own. Well, I know for many of you, different than what OG and I hope for, you're here actually hoping to learn something about money. And by the way, good for you by starting off by making it interesting and then diving in deeper on those topics which interest you. That, by the way, is the same reason why I love my Masterclass subscription. Right now, I'm taking a class by Jeff Goodby and Rich Silverstein. These are the guys that designed Got Milk. They also have worked on many other iconic campaigns for brands from Budweiser to Nike, Apple, and many others. And just when you're trying to craft messages that are in a short amount of time, there is no lesson better than that of a commercial, right? These guys are trying to tell a story beginning, middle, and end. And so I really like their masterclass in advertising and creativity. I also recently took one on comedy with Steve Martin. In fact, I'm getting ready to do another one with Judd Apatow and one about writing with David Sedaris. Now, those are what I'm interested in. You may be interested in many other things like negotiation with Chris Voss or Doris Kearns Goodwin talking about U.S. presidential history and leadership. With Masterclass, you're going to learn from the world's best minds anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. With over 85 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do, well, it's closer than you think. I highly recommend you check it out. Get unlimited access to every masterclass. And as a stacker, you're going to get 15% off an annual membership. Go to masterclass.com slash stacking. That's masterclass.com slash stacking for 15% off masterclass. You're welcome. Hey, trivia fans. I'm your favorite podcast founder, Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug. And I'm at a loss that we haven't yet shown a spotlight on how I built this stellar podcast. I mean, we went from no listeners at all to, well, like more than zero. It used to be just Joe and OG talking to themselves down in the basement. And now I somehow bring down some of the best and brightest voices in all of the various industries. Oh, that's not interesting enough for you? Try this on. Guy could talk to me about how I totally rebuilt the El Camino into an absolute work of art. I mean, purple exterior, white interior, it's its a match made in heaven. He could call it how I rebuilt this. See, there's any number of topics I can speak on, Guy. Well, to continually prove my professionalism, let's get you to today's trivia answer. The question was this. Danny Meyer is the founder of an alternative restaurant chain sweeping the U.S. with their burgers. I think a broom would be easier. Actually, well, what's the name of Danny's restaurant? If you guessed Shake Shack, you'd be right. 
Danny and his team founded the company in 2004, and they took it public in 2015. And now Shake Shack has a market cap of $2.6 billion. Eh, it's not bad, I guess. Now it's my turn, Danny. Time for me to go on and keep building this here podcast. See ya. Big thanks to Guy Raz for stopping by the basement. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency realize people waste too much time figuring out something that's important but shouldn't be time-consuming like life insurance, and they blew up the process and made it so much easier. Their application's simple. It's online. You'll get an instant coverage decision. They have affordable prices, and at the same time, you're not dealing with some startup. While they definitely have a startup culture, they are also backed by Mass Mutual, more than 160-year-old insurer. Today, we're going to throw out the lifeline to Francisco. Say hi, Francisco. My question was in regards to expense ratios and how important that is when it comes to evaluating different assets, specifically if it's worth it to switch from a somewhat high expense ratio asset to a lower expense ratio asset, something like 0.35 versus 0.03 or, or something like that. And would that math change if it's in a uh, tax advantage account or just a normal uh, investing account? Thank you. Oh, we haven't talked about this in a while. And this is the most popular topic on the internet, the expense ratio and controlling expenses on your investments. Really important to control your expenses on investments. And it's an easy way to get a little win. But OG, what do you think about expense ratios and how important it is to the backbone of your financial plan? I can't tell if he's trying to kind of kick up a dust storm or if it's a new guy and he just really doesn't know. Let's assume because of our new, a new guy doesn't know Westwood one affiliation that maybe Francisco hasn't listened to us in a while. Francisco, so. that's fun to say. I wonder how, how many people have said that to him in his lifetime. That, that his name's fun to say. Yes. Yeah, from elf. Come on, dude. Oh, good morning, Mr. Hobbs. Good morning, Sarah. Good morning, Sarah. It's a nice purple dress. It's very purpley. Francisco. Oh, Mr. Hobbs. Francisco, that's fun to say. Francisco. <laughs> that's fun to say. That's fun to say. So let's talk expense ratios. Yeah. So on investment products like mutual funds and ETFs in particular, and, and other investment products as well, usually um, it costs money to have them. It costs money for the people who put them together. It costs money for the buildings that they fill with people or not people anymore, but uh, work from home costs uh, money for technology and so on and so forth. And the way that they charge you for that money is by way of an expense ratio. An expense ratio is a cost that you don't actually see. You don't see a negative in your statement when it's time to pay your expense ratio. It comes out of the return of the fund on a daily basis. So when you see, hey, my stock was, or my, my mutual fund was up uh, 1% today, it, that's your money. It's net of all of the costs associated with that. So they've got a really good racket going and don't like it when you monkey with their racket. However, it's been pretty well known for a long time that higher costs lead to lower long-term returns. So there's been a push very overtly to, to lower those internal costs. And some of that's done through technology and having fewer people and that sort of thing. And, and some of it is done through just the product itself. If you look at a, a mutual fund that has a lot of trading involved in it, or it's got a lot of esoteric type positions. Maybe it's a specific type of investment. You know, it only focuses on companies that are headquartered in Vietnam. You know, that's going to be a higher cost type of product. But then you enter a company like Vanguard who might say, oh, well, we can just give you an international fund. We'll just own one of everything and we can do that very inexpensively. So on par, if you're looking at something that is higher cost versus lower cost, generally you want to go with the lower cost one. You know, there's no reason to pay 1% when you can pay half a percent or half when you pay a quarter or a quarter when you can pay a tenth or whatever the thing is. It's a very easy way. It's a very quick win, you know, to kind of reshuffle the portfolio a smidge and say, oh, well, now I've picked up a few extra tenths of a percent to my long-term investment plan, which is fine. What people tend to do, however, is also use this as the crutch for 
just about every other decision that they've got to make. So we were talking uh, the other day about dying early so you don't have to save enough money. We can use this also as a crutch for not saving enough money. You know, well, if my expense ratios weren't so high, then I'd be rich. Or we use these really low cost products and trade the heck out of them. You know, I'm going to trade between all these things because it's so inexpensive. And we see this, you know, in, in actual trading data over the last six, eight months. Remember last fall is when the bottom fell out on trading costs, remember? So Schwab said, hey, we're not going to do commissions on on stocks anymore. And within a few days, everybody else was like, boom, 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 we're good too. But the bad news is it was bad before that. Like, it's just gotten worse. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but, because there's but, no there's no barrier to entry. Yeah. Even when there were trading costs, there were people that were trading their mutual funds, actively managed mutual funds, where they had a manager already installed, taking yeah. care of business for them, and they're the actively trader trading. trading. Yes. Tra- yeah. So it, it masks a lot of symptoms of other problems. It's like you go, well, at least I don't pay a lot for this thing that I'm abusing and getting completely wrong all the time. You know, So if you're looking at it from the perspective of I've got two investments, they're identical in every way, and they meet my goals in every way, and one costs A and one costs B, and B is lower than A, pick B. It's pretty easy. If you're looking at two arbitrary investments and you're going, well, my 401k, I have a Fund A, which charges 1%, and in my brokerage account, I've got Fund B that charges 0.1%. That must mean Fund A in my 401k is bad. That's not a fair comparison because your 401k may only have a limited option or it may be a specific uh, sector that you're looking at You know that is going to cost more. So it's not just a purely, like you, you can't sort by show me the cheapest crap and I'm going to buy it. You know, You still have to find the thing that meets your goal. And then within that, list of things and try to find the one that's least expensive. But you you and I have seen, I mean, just to be clear, you and I have seen people that have used crappy financial products meet their goal. They got to their goal. You know why? Because they did all the other stuff. Stuff that you can control. But I've never seen people with phenomenal products, but didn't save a dime into them, reach their goal, which shows you where in the hierarchy this should go. Yeah. Yeah, it, so, I mean, you've heard Dave Ramsey say nobody gets rich on credit card points. Yeah. We know lots of people who are very good at taking free vacations on credit card points. But I've never known anybody who's like, who's like, the reason that I'm financially independent is because I've, you know, and that's kind of Dave's Because of my like, 2% you, cash back card. You use it to add some benefits to your already existing, well thought out system. And that's how this is too. You need to save enough money. You need to make sure your money's in the right place. You need to have reasonable goals. You need to spend less than you make. You need to do all of these things. And then the cherry on the top is, and then I found something that's not as expensive. The number one thing to do in your financial plan is to create great systems, processes, and behaviors that allow you to save more money. That is it. So Francisco, what a fun name to say. Francisco, the uh, the answer to your question is yes, lower your expense ratios. In a tax advantaged account, you can do that without worrying about the tax implication, the short term tax implication of making that trade. In a account that's not tax advantaged, of course, you're going to have to see if there's any taxes with regard to that trade. And also, if you're still in the type of an account that has fees, When you change from account one to account two, then you also have to take into account what the effect of those fees are going to be. However, that's not going to change the game as much as people think it's going to change it. That's right. Thanks for the question, Francisco. We actually did that without getting as snarky as we have in the past. That's because Francisco seems like a cool dude. So, And in fact, for being brave, we are going to have Gertrude, mom's friend, who runs our basement Facebook group, Send him a Greatest Money Show on Earth t-shirt. You too can ask a question that we will answer. If you've got a phone or a computer that has a built-in microphone, pretty easy. Just go to stackybedjamins.com forward slash voicemail. You press one button and then it will record your question and uh, you can hear OG and I talk about how cool your name is as well. That's going to do it for today, everybody. Big thanks again to Guy Raz for hanging out with us today. Thanks to you for taking time out of your busy schedule to hang out with us as well. You weren't thanking me. Uh, uh, Well, you know, after I thank the listeners. And by the way, the way you can thank yourself 
for doing the right thing is, is if you have a not so good financial plan and you need better help in your corner, you can head to stackybedjamins.com forward slash OG and that will lead you to his team's calendar and you can see how they can interface with you to maybe make your financial plan better. All right, that's going to do it for today. Doug, you got it from your man. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. You can actually live abroad for much cheaper than you might think. And the quality of life isn't as much different than living here in the U.S. as you would think. Go try it out for a month. Second, take a lesson from Guy Raz. A great way to get inspiration and learn is by taking lessons from some of your favorite people on how they built their companies. But the big takeaway... Since Guy isn't going to have me on his podcast, I think it's time I built my own. I'm going to go ahead and call it How I Rebuilt This. It's going to be huge. Hashtag Doug 2020. Thanks to Guy Raz for joining us on the show. You'll find a link to his book, How I Built This, on our show notes page at stackingbenjamins.com. You'll help the show and help independent booksellers. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Taylor Stevens, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at SBenjamin'sCast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I do not like computer jokes, not one bit. SB Podcast may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. And want more on my new show, How I Rebuilt This?, My first episode will be how I could totally rebuild Blockbuster. We're going to call it Be Kind, Rewind, Blockbuster's Biz Plan. Also, my cousin Ned would be a great guest. He works on remodeling, and he's rebuilt so much stuff. He's a natural. Oh, oh, retaining walls. That'd be a steadying story. Or, um, oh, oh, roofs. There'd be no leak in that storyline. I could keep going. Fences! We could talk about picket lines. No, even kitchens. He's done some great kitchens. Man, we'd cook up something good for that episode. Francisco. 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 Welcome to the after show. If you're new to the show, this is the part of the show that doesn't exist. What uh, happens here stays here. And I have to, um, I, I saw this that I thought of you because of your obsession lately, OG, with flying. I don't know if you saw this. Uh, obsession. Th- this is from the Associated Press. Airline crews report jetpack flyer near Los Angeles airport. Did you see this? Yes, I did. <laughs> Due to my obsession. The Federal Aviation Administration, the FBI, said a couple weeks ago, two airline flight crews reported seeing what appeared to be somebody in a jetpack as they were on their final approaches to LAX. Now, here's the weird thing. There is an industry expert, David Maiman, who was dubious it was a jetpack. He said it's very, very unlikely with the existing technology, said Maiman, CEO of Los Angeles-based company Jetpack Aviation. I'm open to being surprised, but I don't think there's anyone working on a technology that could do a flight from ground to 3,000 feet and come back down again, which proves it was probably an alien. I'm sure it was an alien. 
Well, I was a little skeptical at first as well, but apparently there was a number of reports. So, you know, when there's one report, you know, you're like, oh, whatever. But um, but when there was multiple ones. You know, well, now it's weird. You had a couple of years ago. Do you remember all project. the Navy pilots that saw the UFO? <clears throat> like these aren't, yeah. d- d- these aren't your run of the mill. I saw Bigfoot people, you know. His name's Daryl. <laughs> well, d- d- why, why do you say his name? Why is his name Bob or Jim? It's Daryl. You're going back to Daryl and my other brother, Daryl, from the New Heart Show? No. Progressive commercial. <laughs> no, you haven't seen that one either. <laughs> Anyways. On a second. Let's see if I can pull it up. People used to care. Heck, they'd come all the way out here just for a blurry photo of me. Oh, uh, that's a good one. Wait, what's that? That's just a low battery warning. Oh, right, right. Now it's all, check out my RV and let's go four-wheeling. Maybe there's a little part of me that wanted to be seen. Well, Progressive helps people save when they bundle their home with their outdoor vehicles, so they've got other things to do now, Bigfoot. Wait, what did you just call me? Bigfoot? My name is Daryl. <laughs> As he sticks his foot out. <laughs> Progressive, if you want to sponsor the show, Joe at StackyBenjamins.com. Please do. So, but anyway, you saw the, uh, you saw the Navy pilots. So you're saying it's all, uh, it's all, we're being invaded. I think we're being invaded. I what, think you probably are right, actually. What if they tell us the secrets of the universe and it turns out that it's uh, keeping your expense ratios low? Wouldn't that be something? That, that was the key to their incredible success and how they can do, do now do things like mind read and they have a collective consciousness which allows them to get further and they've explored the entire universe. They know all the secrets. And it was because of the fact that they went from 0.3 to 0.03 on their exchange traded fund. Joke would be on us though, wouldn't it? It would be on us. <laughs>